Welcome back everyone. We're going to start with our next session, India Perceptions from the APEC community. To chair the session, we have uh, Dr. Dipargya Mukherjee, who will be replacing Francis Hutchinson, who could not make it today. Uh, he's already been introduced yesterday as a speaker, so I'll just pass on the floor to him. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you've had a sumptuous lunch. And we are back for one of the more important sessions, India's perceptions from the APEC community. And to speak, uh, we have three eminent people. We'll start with Mr. Eduardo Poet Pedrosa from the APEC, uh, from the PEC. Uh, he's already told me not to introduce him much. Uh, well, he, uh, I would presume most of you know know him pretty well. He's co-edited books and has been advisor to various corporate clients. So we'll start with his presentation, but I'll take this opportunity to introduce the other speakers as well. Uh, uh, the second presentation uh, would be India and East Asia's Regional Economic Architecture, a China Perspective by Dr. Sarah Tong. Uh, Dr. Sarah Tong is a senior research fellow at the East Asia Institute, and she's been authoring various papers for journals. She's also been a reviewer in very reputed journals. So that's Dr. Sarah Tong. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Nagy. Uh, he has been uh, an assistant professor in various universities like uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong and till about 2014 and is currently investigating Chinese perceptions of Japan's for the policy on the year since 2012. So uh, with that, I would ask uh, Mr. Pedrosa to start off. Uh, we'll have three presentations, and we have one hour. So approximately 20 minutes per presentation, and around 15 minutes or so, I'll just wave and okay, over to you. Well, uh, let me begin by expressing my appreciation to ISAS for the very kind invitation, especially to partners here in the England Ken Conclave, um, if you like. I'm never sure whether I should um, introduce the organization I work for. I see so many PowerPoint presentations that this gets done. But I think there's a certain relevance, I think, to doing a little bit of an introduction here. Um, PEC is, it, it is an unusual beast in that it, it, it never knows how to describe itself properly. Um, one of the things we describe ourselves as being is a progenitor of APEC. And so there's a certain very sort of close uh, relationship between the two. We're also slightly of a, of a, of a non-governmental organization, although one third of our membership, in fact, is, is from the government. And we also describe ourselves as a think tank. Um, so there are all kinds of ways I, I could come at this, um, this issue. Uh, as with Carlos yesterday, I, sh I should probably emphasize the little disclaimer at the bottom of this uh, slide that I the views I'm expressing here really are, are my own and that necessarily, I think that's what the word, reflect those of the institution as a whole, nor of our members. Uh, that said, uh, everything I'm going to say is pretty much based on work that we have done, and I think um, there's some relevance for, <coughs> for what you've been discussing here over these um, two days. Um, much of what is in this slide what was said um, yesterday um, much more eloquently by, by John, so I, I don't know if I should really, really say it, but I, I wanted to sort of begin this presentation by talking about the concept of the Asian Pacific region and, and, its, and its history. But I'll do that, I think, more fun since this is after lunch with some animation that you're all going to sleep now. Carefully looking at Ganesh and Vinny, uh, see if they're awake or asleep. Obviously, Vinny's somewhere between them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Vinny. Um, so this is so. Uh, Kojima was a Japanese economist, um, and so he, uh, attending a conference, perhaps one of them, like this, had this wonderful idea of the Pacific Free Trade Area, and um, you know this idea didn't come out of isolation. It came really in response to integration initiatives um, in in Europe um, at that time. Uh, his idea wasn't for a, a grand FTAP, it was really between the industrialized or industrializing economies um, in the Pacific Rim. Um, at the same time, there were thereabouts, um, ASEAN was beginning its long, long journey 
And this, this slide really divides um, sort of the, the evolution of regionalism into two different conceptual ideas. And not really, uh, John yesterday talked about different uh, concepts of, it, of the region, one being East Asian one, and the other <coughs> being uh, an Asia Pacific one. And I'm dividing this and cutting this slightly differently. Um, that sort of PAFTA didn't happen, but it did lead um, to, to PAFTAD, uh, an annual series of conferences of, of, of eminent thinkers. Uh, PAFTAD has, uh, continues to have some influence in thinking about uh, the development of, of the region and interest in me, for those of you from India, um, it is one of the institutions that's called Pacific, that India is in fact a member of. At the same time, PBEC uh, was created, uh, and that was by businessmen who were uh, realizing the opportunities that existed, saw that there was a lack of networking, and they then created themselves. Uh, much passed by, and then my own institution was created in, in 1980. And so that brought together the academics, the business people, and the government officials in an unofficial capacity. If there's you know, a tautology in there, I apologize. Uh, and then sort of Peck likes to claim, and I think, I think it's written into the APEC history, that out of that 10-year process, or 9-year process, then the space opened up and APEC came about. And then I guess the next step in the evolution, and that should be slightly more of a dotted line, is whether we move towards an FTAP question. Now, uh, this kind of regionalism is a much looser, less formal, and non-binding type of cooperation. It's, it's cooperation. It's, it's, we're not trying to achieve or set rules. We're trying to work together. Uh, the, one of the, my favorite um, descriptions of APEC was given by former Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines who described APEC as Alcoholics Anonymous. You all know you've got a problem. Um, you know that it's up to you to solve that problem, but you like coming together to talk about how you're going to solve that problem. So that's Alcoholics Anonymous. APEC is Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's regional cooperation, if you, if you like. Um, on the other side, um, Perhaps unfairly, um, we have ASEAN, uh, then, so, which is kind of on the on the regional cooperation and eventually on the regional integration. A more formal rule setting process takes place on the right side of the slide, um, and, and then we move on to NAFTA. So we, we, we're moving towards preferential trade agreements here. So we have AFTA, we have NAFTA, and of course before that we had ANSERTA, perhaps the, the oldest of the preferential trade agreements in the Asia Pacific region, and then. Got some lines going down from after and Ancerta uh, down to the ASEAN plus ones that uh, come during the 2005 to 2009 period. And then, of course, you also have the TPP launched in 2005, another sort of more formal, more binding. I might put that over towards the left side of this slide because I see it somewhat as an outgrowth of the APEC process. When it was the P4, the originators definitely saw it as being a part of the APEC process. Their reason and justification for launching the P4 at that time was APEC's modality of concerted unilateralism was seen to be foundering. Um, there wasn't much happening in the WTO at that time. So they thought, how can we move towards this? Let's experiment with the P4. And that is what eventually evolved to become the TPP. Also, on the other side, on the plus ones, we have the RCEP launched in uh, 2011, an attempt to bring the uh, different ASEAN plus ones together. I skip over an incredibly rich part of, of the history of the ASEAN plus ones. And since I'm looking at Ganesh, I, I, I would sort of not be remiss if I didn't talk about the sort of debate between the, well, not only East Asia versus <laughs> Asia Pacific notions of regionalism, so the notions of ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six versions of regionalism that took place in that, in that run up to the RCEP. And of course, the question mark now is whether the RCEP and TPP can eventually somehow involve themselves or come together in a broader free trade area or indeed perhaps agreement of the Asia Pacific. And then I've drawn a funny big curve down from. Kojima down to the FTAP to ask the question that are we coming around somehow full circle. So that's one way of trying to understand the Asia Pacific region and indeed probably more importantly the different influences and pressures that exist in Asia Pacific cooperation. 
we like to lay claim to the idea that APEC is not a negotiating forum, and in many ways it isn't. It's not trying to set rules. They're not negotiating um, tariff reductions, although they have, in terms of the, the environmental goods agreement. And of course, they did coalesce um, together uh, to agree on and, and provide, I guess, critical mass behind the original ITA agreement. So, yes, it's cooperation, but there are also pressures for formality in there. Those pressures for formality found themselves, I guess, embodied, if you like, in the TPP. Uh, where are we in terms of the economic context? I like this chart in particular because it shows the structural break in growth that we've seen in the post GFC years. Um, before the GFC, nice growth uh, for the Asia Pacific region around 5%. Uh, in the, well, except in 2010, which is an exception, the average growth is more around 3.4%. So there's a quest here. A lot of the narrative you see around um, Asia Pacific cooperation and indeed globally in the G20 is where's growth going to come from? What are the growth engines going to be? And that's an important narrative to bear in mind if you're thinking about Asia Pacific cooperation. Um, and then I'm going to sort of move on quickly to talk about China and India in the world economy and to keep everyone awake. I, I again, add an animation because I think it's always fun to do this. Um, so back in 1980, well, 1.7% for, for India, 2.7% for China. And then you get uh, China's growing up and very, very rapid expansion. So that differential is now enormous. Uh, India is remains. This is GDP. Uh, India around 3.6% and China closer to 18%. So throughout uh, China's integration into the region, it's grown massively. We have become a huge power. 3.6% of the world economy is not unsizable, but clearly a big differential has developed between these two giants in terms of land mass and population. So the last little bit of animation is this one, the exciting one, where we see India 24.5% and China 22.3%. But to keep everyone awake, what, does anyone want to take any guesses at what the question mark is hiding? 2087, first take Ganesh, 2050. No, I'm, I'm cheating. It's 1700, of course, with Back to the Future. I'm sorry, but that, this is from Agus Madison's um, database on the world economy, so I'm sorry, Carl. I was just deliberately misleading you with a cheap shot after lunch. Um, but, uh, but again, that does speak to the, the, well, I guess the potential for India. It's there, of course, um, huge population, um, but lots to be done, um, and, and that's why there's potential excitement over, over India. With slowing growth, people look for growth engines, and can India potentially be an engine that adds to the, the broader uh, Asian Pacific story? Uh, the, these are imports, um, uh, in these imports from, from APEC uh, members. Uh, big growth from 2000 up to about 140 billion or so US dollars. Um, increasing share um, from 28% up to 38%, but you see that that's gone up and down as well. So. Never quite sure of that, but I think it does show at least um, growing importance and perhaps a, in the future an even bigger share. Carl will show more details on, on, on these numbers and how they've changed over time as well. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of uh, the very short time I have uh, talking about the results of the survey that uh, my organization does. Um, I've got a copy of the report here. What we do is we try and survey um, the policy community involved in Asia-Pacific cooperation on their views of what they think uh, is happening in the region and what they think is important, and on some key questions, such as what should APEC leaders talk about, what do you think of the FTAP, and so on. This shows you the breakdown. Um, by and large, it's mostly um, non-governmental people, uh, academics, such as people from this uh, community society and the media, if, if Simon and others um, can find the time to respond, if they ever do. I'm not sure if I've asked you, Simon. <laughs> Sorry about that. I've asked other people. Um, but also 163 people from government, those tend to be the APEC senior officials, um, some of the ministers, uh, central bankers, uh, different government agencies. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a quite a broad sweep. It includes people from treasuries, 
people from foreign affairs, people from trade, and so forth. Uh, 211 business people for this survey, well, at least for 2015. Uh, those are the ABAC members, uh, former ABAC members, and um, primarily your counterparts from different uh, chambers of commerce. And um, this is the breakdown by subregion. It, 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 it just it's a I just show this to show it's a fairly broad uh, representation from from the Asia Pacific, which is very broad. The others tends to be people in Geneva who work on on Asia Pacific cooperation issues. Um, show this to you. Um, this is views on the outlook for the global economy. I draw your attention to the last uh, bar on the right side, where there is a sense of um, pessimism uh, for what's going to happen over the next year. 40% think that economic growth will be weaker next year, and only 18% think it will be stronger. And I think that shows you why this narrative on economic growth um, continues to be very important. In spite of everything that um, APEC has said on its growth strategy, in spite of everything that G20 has said on, on its, uh, the policy community remains very, very worried about the future of growth, and rightly so, if you look at the latest economic forecasts and industrial manufacturing indices. Uh, to get the fun, what do people think of, of India? Well, they were very excited about India. 41.4% thought that growth uh, from India would be stronger over the next 12 months, but only 16% thinking it would be slower. And the most optimistic out of the sub-regions of the Asia Pacific are uh, the Northeast Asians. Um, this is from a 2014 survey, where will growth come from? And I think what you see here is, uh, at least from the Asia Pacific policy community, a really high importance on policy to see reforms. So this is domestic reform, as we talked about in the last session, technological innovation, by others, the traditional drivers of growth, the external sector, exports are slightly less important than perhaps they would have said so 15 to 20 years ago. So this is the crux of what I wanted to talk about. Does the Asia-Pacific policy community know India? Is, is there a sense of engagement that we know, uh, you know is, what do we know about India? And so as a proxy for that, I've, I've selected those who said, I don't know anything, I can't venture an opinion on the Indian economy. So only 0.6% of our survey respondents didn't want to say anything about China, 0.8% on the United States, 0.9% on the global economy, 1.4% on Japan, 25 on the European Union, and what about India? Um, fairly close to the region. Um, sometimes we're engaged, sometimes we're not. Uh, what kind of percentage would we be talking about here? 33%, um, I'll It's 2.6%. Now, that's nothing, it's a small number. But I think you should take that with a pinch of salt and think that that is as many, in fact, slightly more than those who didn't want to venture an opinion on the European Union, which is very far away. If India is part of the community, quite a lot needs to be done so that at least we actually know what's happening in India. Um, I'll break this down. Those who knew the least, uh, North Americans and, and North East. Asians, uh, that's uh, something quite telling them, probably the, the North Americans, at least the furthest away it is. Um, should India be a member of APEC? The question that you all want to know the answer to, I suppose, and an overwhelming, I think, Ambassador Sham, um, you might be pleased to know that at least amongst those people we surveyed, almost 60% think that India should be a member of APEC. And what should be somewhat disconcerting survey results, however, is the least enthused of those from Southeast Asia. That's, that's, that's still a sizable uh, percentage in favor, but less than 50%, and these are your closest partners in the region. So much, I think, needs to still be done working on ASEAN and their perceptions of India. That's, um, interestingly, Carlos, I think, 71% from Pacific South America think India should be a member of APEC. And I, we've talked about this a little bit as well. Um, and the only thing I can think of is they don't have any other mechanism really to engage India. The Southeast Asians do through the East Asia Summit and, and others. And of course, the ASEAN negotiations. The South Americans, however, don't. And that's possibly why there's such um, interest from, from there. 
Now, again, very interesting, same results that cut by different types of stakeholders. The business people, most enthusiastic, looking at India, excitement over India, big, big market, money to be made, that's what the business people think about. Um, academics, um, we don't really matter very much, but we still like the idea of India joining a big war. But um, government people, again, um, not a majority, 43.6%, a sizable number, but less so. And I think, again, something to think about. How do you engage and convince, ultimately, the people who matter in making the decision that India should be a member of APEC? Um, and this, I think, is almost my last slide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Um, now, that might be a large number, but bear, that, bear in mind that not many people think that the expansion of APEC should be a priority for APEC leaders' discussions. It's been going up um, from pretty low numbers, you know, 14 percent, up to 17.8 percent last year. But that made it only the 13th highest priority. And, and effectively, I, I can probably tell you I'm not divulging a huge state secret here, but it's really not discussed very much. Um, it's discussed only on the margins. And I, the way I think about it, it's an incredibly difficult issue for the reasons we talked about earlier. It's not just about India, but uh, if you open up the membership discussion, we're talking about bringing in six or seven other members, which would hugely complicate the APEC discussion, and perhaps make it even less relevant and less able to make decisions uh, than it would. So again, things to think about and to put some reassurances on the table. Um, uh, conclusions. Asia Pacific is a contract, the variability of boundaries, and no definitions. I, I like to think of it as a community of communities. There are business people, there are different types of, of government officials at the, of course, at the summit level, there are those. But then you have different communities of interest, people who are really interested, deeply interested, who dominate and suck all the air, out, all the oxygen out of the air. The trade negotiators, they're one set of communities. But then you have finance officials, they're not looking to do anything binding, they're just looking for a good conversation and maybe say something about currencies because that's all they have there. Um, human resource development people, development experts, and they now tend to coalesce around what has become a very large um, set of meetings that has become APEC. There are different visions and forces at play to bear in mind. There's the regional cooperation, having a good chat, understanding each other, but there's also the regional integration and we're finding things that excite people like um, like the access to negotiations. Uh, there is an evolving agenda out there, a quest for growth engines, and that's where I think the excitement over India could be. Um, the demographics of India are in its favor. Business sector interests, we talk a lot about inclusive growth. India has a lot to share on that. A lot of India's businesses uh, are targeted at the lower segments of the of the pyramid, and that's something that can excite at least um, some policy makers and stakeholders in the rest of East Asia. I think there's a broad recognition of, of India's importance, but at the margin, there's a lack of knowledge, I think, amongst the Asian Pacific policy community. It makes, I think, this conference quite important. We probably need much more of this, but I would bear in mind that the APEC expansion remains low, but I don't know how that will evolve. Thank you, uh, Ed, for the rather good overview of APEC and then uh, the prospects for the future and finally probably a pessimistic note for people in India who want to join the APEC. <laughs> okay, the next presentation by Dr. Sarah Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. session discussion, I, I think I already have gained quite a, a lot. Uh, in particular, um, in the discussion on, about India, about Vietnam, uh, reminded me of a lot of discussions on China's economy. My, my area is, uh, I look at China's economy uh, quite a bit. Um, the, um, the other uh, point I want to also highlight before I get started 
um, is the, uh, the notion that the um, economic opening and integration with the rest of the world uh, is one on one part of the domestic policy. Uh, and domestic, or, or domestic cons uh, considerations is always more important in the government's uh, decision making. Uh, one last point I want to make uh, is the uh, discussion also about India and, and, and Vietnam is the external, the so-called external pressure uh, in terms of joining uh, multilateral uh, in, in, uh, organizations or joining TPP or whatever other is, uh, institutions as a pressure to promote domestic reforms. Um, that also echoes uh, China's practice uh, in the past um, in terms of its own reform in economic development. Um, okay, so we get started. Um, um, my name is Sarah Tung, is the East Asian Institute. Um, I have a rather limited knowledge about India, but uh, my discussion will be looking at China's perspective in terms of East Asia regional uh, economic integration. So uh, this is a, a, a rather um, rough outline of what uh, I'm going to be talking about. Um, I think uh, really in India's role in the East Asia regional uh, economic uh, architecture, we start with how this Asia or East Asia uh, economic integration means for China. Um, so that's uh, sort of the first part. And the second part is how China has attempted to um, go out and to strengthen or to initiate um, uh, act, uh, actions to strengthen uh, either bilateral or regional uh, economic integration, and lastly, looking at uh, more particularly on China uh, and India's role in this whole uh, architecture and, and what are the challenges. Um, so first, um, ever since uh, the, the late 1970s, uh, when China started is so-called open door and economic reform. External sector or external economy has been very, very crucial. And it's uh, as a result of that, I think it will remain to be essential for China. So that's the first point I want to highlight. Uh, I'm sitting too far away, so I'm having trouble reading <laughs> myself. Um, My glasses are very I think if you're comfortable, you could even present from here. of uh, foreign capitals and also technology and managerial skills and more importantly the market. Um, 2001 China's WTO accession has provided a new force um, for China's growth and in, and also as mentioned about uh, Vietnam's opening up, WTO did force China or provided the, the government a very strong imperatives to pr promote domestic reforms, and that has started China's uh, rapid expansion in both trade uh, as well as the overall economy. As a result, um, China has not only become a, uh, the, the top tr uh, trading nation, uh, more particularly, more importantly, uh, China has utilized uh, that uh, uh, WTO linkages to strengthen and to be engaged and entrench a, the so-called East Asian production network. And China, that network has become increasingly a, a East Asia-centric. And China has played a very important role uh, in that network. Uh, 
as a result, um, at present, China is very heavily dependent on trade. Uh, this is not only because uh, China's import and export has accounted for as a share, or sorry, as a ratio of the economy as a very uh, high ratio, and uh, in particular, the employment is very important, employment generated by the trade sectors. Um, second, uh, it's not only the volume, but the structure. China's trade structure is rather skewed in the sense that the trade-related sectors have received much more investment and growth much faster compared to other sectors. And that means China is dependent, the economy is dependent on the trade volumes in and out to sustain its, uh, its, uh, its production uh, and, and also its output. Um, as part of the reason why the, uh, the weakening or the deceleration in global economy has also caused uh, much uh, headaches to the domestic economy. Uh, at present, uh, as China is trying to move away from this heavily uh, trade-dependent and export-oriented investment-driven economy, the, the leadership or the government is trying to move away to uh, toward a so-called consumption-based or consumption-driven um, but because trade itself is, uh, is very closely related to the industrial structure, that adjustment has been quite difficult in, in certain regions in particular, uh, in the southern part of Guangdong, uh, Guangdong region in particular. Uh, the second, uh, the, the other aspect to look at how uh, this econ external economy will remain essential is in part um, the, the world economy, especially in the advanced uh, part or the North America and the European Union, and including Japan, remains weak and uncertain. As a, uh, a second, of, second part of that is the, uh, the so-called uh, BRICS uh, economy, including Russia, Brazil, and South Africa. Uh, the performance in recent years remains rather poorly. Uh, as a result, Asian economies will become, uh, as a relatively ro more robust region, uh, will, will be become more important for, for China. Um, to, uh, to, to, to think or to believe that China will continue to view Asia and East Asia or in Asia and Pacific region as a very important uh, region that China has to develop stronger economic ties. China has been working very hard to extend <coughs> such ties both at bilateral level and multilateral levels. Uh, for bilateral uh, FTAs, China already had uh, around 12 around 12 bilateral uh, FTAs. Um, this past year, China just signed the upgraded uh, ASEAN plus one, and also had FTA with Pakistan, Chile, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the last two, the CEPA Closer Economic Partnership uh, Agreement with Hong Kong and Macau has also been extended to, uh, to cover services and so on. Um, so the that's for the bilateral uh, agreement. Uh, China is also negotiating a, a number of other ones, including uh, China, Japan, Korea, uh, and, and the RCEP, uh, and, and several others. China has started to consider or has uh, started a joint study uh, on the FTAs with, uh, with India, Colombia, uh, Fiji, and Moldova. Uh, the A that's uh, that's the FTAs. In addition, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the TPP, one of the uh, areas uh, we talk about this morning is on the investment. Um, on that ground, uh, on that front, China has already uh, established or signed bilateral investment treaties with. Uh, with at, at this point, there's, there's a hundred, more than a hundred. Um, however, most of the BITs, the bilateral investment treaties, are relatively low 
level. The ones that's uh, quite uh, are more advanced are the ones with the U.S. and the EU, which are currently uh, in negotiation with the U.S. has entered the stage of negative uh, list. Uh, and the EU, uh, the one with the EU has just started the, uh, two days ago, or on the 13th, I started the ninth negotiation uh, on the bilateral treaty, uh, investment treaty with the EU. On the domestic front, China started uh, domestic FTAs, uh, started with Shanghai and then opened up a, a new, a three new ones in Tianjin, Guangdong, and Fujian. The four FTA, pilot FTAs, um, are having very different emphasis, uh, but in any case, um, China is opening, is strengthening its, its uh, external ties, both going out, as well as opening up wider domestically. Um, the pilot FTAs is also experimenting for the first time on um, a negative list approach uh, in Shanghai. Um, but they're also uh, focusing on financial services in other areas. The new initiative that the current leadership has uh, announced, uh, the so-called One Belt One Road initiative, uh, which are still quite vague and not clear. We're not too sure what uh, is involved, uh, but that's one of the new initiatives um, for, uh, for the current leadership. Oh, here is... Uh, <coughs> Um, I'm not sure about the official ones, but this is the so-called uh, the map for the one belt one road. There's uh, uh, the one um, the uh, Central Asia goes through Central Asia to Europe, um, Russia, and the other one goes to Europe. This is from the online, so I have no idea if this is official. <coughs> um, through this uh, um, regional economic cooperation or the uh, East Asia economic architecture, China's efforts has been to uh, strengthen East Asia's central role, in particular um, the so-called ASEAN centrality. Um, that has been uh, China's uh, policy uh, orientation. Um, so if you look at China's efforts in, in recent years, we're, I'm, I'm, look, I'm thinking in the back is uh, one of, part of that initiative is to counter or to compensate the ongoing or the upcoming uh, TPP. Um, so the first one, China ASEAN FTA, has been upgraded and signed. Uh, China, Korea, and, and Japan FTA has been under negotiation for quite a number of years for many, uh, re for, for, for reasons people would uh, easily think of uh, this is still remains uh, quite difficult. Um, RCEP, I think we also have uh, some discussions whether uh, verse, uh, relative to the TPP, this is, uh, I think uh, Deborah used the word drafted members rather than volunteered, voluntary uh, participation. Uh, it's also in the sense that the diversity of the members are much wider. Uh, compared to the members, uh, the top members of the TPP. Um, so it's almost like a, a bottom-up or a top-down approach in these two uh, negotiations. On the other hand, um, you can also think that the RCEP approach or the bottom-up approach is, um, is going to be slow without a very strong uh, enforcer or promoter that is also uh, perhaps uh, practical uh, in the sense if something can be achieved. Uh, AWIB uh, is, is China's new initiative um, which can be um, complemented, can complement some of the other initiatives which I will uh, talk a little bit in the later part. So looking at China-India cooperation, um, I think um, uh, some discussions earlier mentioned on trade. In terms of trading goods, there's a huge bilateral uh, trade imbalances. Uh, from China's perspective, uh, India as a market has been growing in relative importance. While its uh, its importance as a as a, import, a source of imports has remained rather limited. Uh, trading services, China overall had a, a growing 
uh, deficit in trading services, while India has a trade uh, surplus. Uh, so in that area, uh, there are way, uh, there are rooms for uh, much further growth. Uh, in terms of investment, China in, 25th, uh, in 2014, inward and outward direct investment has been largely in balance. In 2015, it's likely that uh, ex, uh, outward investment is going to outpace inward <coughs> investment. Um, I, I, was, uh, I just came back from Shenzhen uh, when we have some uh, discussion with the businesses. Um, the, the local government, um, as, a, as a result of the central government initiatives in trying to help the companies to go out uh, to invest in other countries, and most of the businesses now looking at ASEAN members, in, in Vietnam in particular. Um, so in that sense, there are still a lot of rooms for uh, working together in that area. Um, so, um, so in, in bilateral sense, there are areas in, in regional, in driving regional initiatives. I think China and India has a lot of common aspirations uh, in RCEP and in other initiatives. Um, so I'm looking at this. Uh, uh, China's export to Asia as a share, so as a look at the India's relative significance and the lines um, are the ones in India. I'm taking out Hong Kong because uh, Hong Kong is a little bit messy. Um, so this is uh, taking out Hong Kong. If you look at Japan, which is, uh, has been, in terms of uh, share of China's export to Asia, not to the world, to Asia. Um, so uh, Japan's, uh, Japan's uh, share has been decreasing. ASEAN is increasing, and Korea has uh, pretty much held up, and Hong Kong, uh, sorry, Taiwan, and the lines is, uh, is India. So it has been growing uh, toward uh, about 5 or 5, 6%. In terms of import, again, I'm taking out Hong Kong. Um, again, uh, Japan, Japan is declining, and ASEAN is increasing somewhat, but India remain quite limited in terms of uh, uh, trading uh, import from uh, from India as a total uh, China's import uh, from Asia. So it does, that also to some extent reflects the uh, the bilateral trade imbalances. Uh, this is China's balance of payment in goods and services. In goods, there's a huge and rising trade surplus in service. There's a huge uh, deficit in, in rising. Uh, the last the last 2015 is for the first 11 months. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, China and India does uh, do have uh, do have shared uh, some um, uh, objectives in promoting our RCEP. Um, this is just a comparison of the members in different uh, these two uh, institutions, two organizations. Um, Let me just conclude. Um, I think uh, to conclude, I want to just highlight two things. Um, first, China increasingly values a strong bilateral ties with India, uh, not only because India is, is a large and emerging uh, rising economy, um, but uh, in, in, in the bilateral economic structures, there are some uh, complementary, complementarity, um, and there are also shared some of the inspirations to promote regional economic integration. Um, but overall, perhaps uh, the economic calculation itself is still not the dominant forces uh, other than other considerations as of now, um, although India has become uh, increasingly more important economically as well as otherwise. Um, so that's all, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarantong, for the presentation. Uh, we will straightly move on to the last presentation in this session. Uh, Professor Nagi from Japan. So in a typical Japanese way, I'll begin with a couple of apologies. So uh, my first apology is I apologize for not attending yesterday. I had classes, and the second is 
apologize for not being uh, an economist. There's, there's many economists here. I actually am an international relations scholar. And today I'm going to look at um, the TPP and the APEC relationship more from an IR point of view or the geopolitical ramifications for India. And um, in a nutshell, what I'd like to do is just uh, look at what's in it for India in terms of the APEC and what's in it for India in terms of the TPP. Um, just simple framework, uh, a brief introduction. I'll give you my arguments and research questions that I would like to touch upon. Again, I'm going to introduce a theoretical framework, and uh, you know, linking uh, is my, my key point here. Is I think uh, linking trade, security, and norms is very important. The TPP is illustrative of that, and probably the best uh, direction for India to go in terms of the kind of reforms they would like to engage in. Um, I think we uh, all know there's many competing and overlapping regional organizations within the region. India does form part of those organizations. And India will be, continue to be a, an important uh, economy within the region. It's slated to be the top three economy in terms of GDP by 2030. So it does have impact. It is important in terms of size. And as our previous speakers have mentioned, um, its size means there's a lot of consumers. And there's a lot of consumers consuming as well as um, producing. Um, unfortunately, it's been unable to engage in a lot of uh, or joining international institutions because of its geographical location. So the APEC itself has been an uh, organization that has geographical limitations, so in, in, in a way closed regionalism. Um, its level of development, and I think many of the scholars here talked about the domestic limitations in terms of the Indian con economy, in terms of being able to engage in international institutions. And then, again, um, rather than trade limitations, again, I think uh, many of our scholars today focused on this idea of internal uh, internal um, limitations in terms of how India can uh, progressively and actively engage in different institutions. Um, in a sense, it hasn't been ready to be part of many regional and global institutions, whether it's APEC or other initiatives within the region. Um, but that being said, there's been momentum towards different regional institutions, both focusing on trade and economy. Um, APEC, of course, is one. The TPP is the latest one. We have Ajin Plus Three and many other competing organizations that offer some benefits and some, um, I would say, um, opportunities for momentum and for structural change within India to improve its economy and be more uh, regionally integrated. But that being said, there are many questions in terms of India's inclusion in these organizations. And there's many drivers as well. And again, as a, as a I guess an international relations scholar, I look at power politics. I usually come from a realist point of view. And I think one of the big drivers in terms of driving Indian economic policy in the years to come will be the rise of China or China and really coming forward and stretching out not only its economic wings, but its political wings as well as um, some of its security wings, whether it's the String of Pearl initiatives and One Belt Road initiative, um, which as one of my Indian scholars said, um, India would not like a pearl of necklace around its southern uh, ocean. Um, again, I think we talked about the TPP and the APEC and some of the differences between the two organizations. Again, APEC covers a larger number of countries, more diverse countries, more diverse interests. Uh, the TPP requires acquiescence to an agreed upon a set of rules. And again, I think that's an important di distinguishing feature. We don't, the members aren't drafted, they're not volunteers. Uh, they've made a specific cho uh, choice. Uh, they've agreed upon a certain guidelines, certain norms, and based on those norms, they've decided to forge forward with a very forward-leaning, forward-thinking economic agreement that protects uh, the competitive and comparative advantages of the participating countries. Um, they differ very much in terms of their vision and objectives they have for trade. That being said, I think um, both, uh, both regional uh, economic institutions do have opportunities, uh, strategic <coughs> opportunities in terms of politics, economics, and uh, security for India. And I'd like to argue uh, in particular that the TPP is important because it anchors TPP members not only economically but security-wise. And I'm going to focus mostly on the South China Sea because I think it's a crucial choke point in terms of um, the direction of trade, and uh, it brings in stakeholders into the region. And again, my last point there is it buttresses economic and security commitments to the region. 
and by contributing to multilateralization of common goods associated with the South China Sea and by increasing the stakes for countries interested in changing the status quo or engaging in sort of behavior. And again, I, I don't need to mention the country, but um, recent initiatives in terms of the sandcastle building in the South China Sea is a very good example. But also um, competing or um, we'll call them competing uh, regional, uh, regional institutions like AIIB or One Belt, One Road initiatives do represent a, a challenge to um, regional order, uh, both in terms of economics, political influence, and security. So some important questions that we should ask when we're talking about India and these particular trade agreements is again, first of all, why has India remained outside these regional trade agreements? And I think many of our speakers talked about this. Are there real economic, political, and security benefits to joining APEC and the TPP? And I guess some of our previous speakers, like Mr. Pedrosa, talked about APEC in terms of being a more uh, an institution characterized by soft institutionalism, a lot of talk and a, a little bit less action, but vision-oriented, and the TPP being very um, norm-based, rule-based, as, as uh, Deborah mentioned earlier this morning. Um, we need to talk about, again, or try to answer the question, what are the geopolitical consequences for joining either of these organizations, or one of these organizations? And lastly, is India ready? And I guess I come up with a mixed message here in terms of is India ready? Um, what I'd like to do in terms of thinking about this these questions and this particular argument is trying to look at um, first level of, of, of analysis is norm building. Has there been norm building to build these to include um, India in these regional organizations? So norms means rules, a common understanding of trade, a common understanding of behavior. Second is to look at trade agreements and how these may be illustrative of uh, again a, a common understanding of norms. And lastly, um, how are these related to security cooperation? Can in, or did the security cooperation uh, stemming from TPP uh, represent opportunity for India to de deal with some of its security issues vis-a-vis -vis, um, its northern neighbor? And I don't mean Nepal. So again, um, firstly, APEC, uh, an important organization. We know a little bit about its history. Its raison d'être is a commitment to re deregulation economic cooperation. And this is really important. It's a, it's a commitment to deregulation. There's not an agreement to deregulation. There's not a, an agreed upon uh, set of, of rules that we're going to deregulate here and deregulate there. So it, it's an organization ba based on a trajectory, on a vision, rather than firm rules. I think it de-emphasizes shared norms uh, and creating shared rules, um, although it does have a direction. Uh, I would argue that it has few tangible results in terms of the way it's going in terms of an organization, although um, dialogue, uh, yearly dialogue is important, uh, bringing up issues facing the region is important, but also tangible results is an important aspect of, of a regional organization. Um, we do have a dilution in policy focus as, as, in an, as we see an increasing number of voices, levels of development and governance which need to be represented. So we have uh, as diverse members as Russia and Papua New Guinea. So it's difficult for me to understand where their commonality lies, except for uh, perhaps their position in the, in the uh, Asian Pacific. Um, and again, the, how do we harmonize these voices? How do we harmonize uh, agendas with such different levels of development, uh, political systems, etc.? Again, APEC represents what we call soft institutionalism. Again, it has a diversity of members that make it difficult for APEC to exert sustained, meaningful leadership and momentum to realize its initial objectives. And I would like to put that in the framework of India. Does India need another organization that finds it difficult to engage in sustained, meaningful leadership? Um, and I, I would argue, no. Um, also, uh, if APEC was a very successful organization, I'm not sure we'd have so many regional organizations competing for uh, influence. And again, there's many. We have ASEAN Plus 3, 6, 10, the One Boat One initiative coming out of China, AAIB. Again, these have filled the policy action and that implementation vacuum and has been a major stumbling block for um, APEC. So again, moving into a more discussion, what does APEC offer for India? Again, India's inclusion into APEC may be, have tangible and intangible benefits. Again, a seat at the APEC table 
of course, allow India to put input in terms of, in terms of its initiatives and the direction of APEC. Um, up to now, most uh, of the direction of, of East Asia and, East A and the Asian in interests have been represented by China, Japan, and, and South Korea, which are not exactly um, um, economies and political systems that um, link up or sync with India's interests and initiatives and levels of development. We should understand that there's no real security cooperation between Japan and India or South Korea and India, and as a result, maybe their interests do overlap with an APEC context. But there is a security comp competition between China and India, and as a result, in the APEC organization, India's voice may be uh, not represented by participating countries. So again, there is an uh, important place for India at the table, and Indian um, membership in APEC may attenuate some of the attenuating Chinese, or might, might attenuate some Chinese influence in APEC that may be counter to India's national interest. So from a, a geopolitical standpoint, there's a lot of gains here joining the APEC. What about the TPP? Now the TPP, is, as Deborah mentioned, is, is an exclusive architecture centered around ASEAN countries, and I think an important aspect is it tethers these ASEAN countries to large developed economies in the US, Japan, Canada, Australia, etc. Importantly, it har harnesses and harmonizes uh, the comparative, comparative advantages of developing countries and developed countries to create a trans-Pacific economic group firmly rooted in norms, 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 so rules, that's very important. Um, new norms establish a common understanding between participants and future participating countries. So if you want to join this organization, you have to agree upon um, pre-agreed rules. I think importantly, it edges participants away from uh, a China-centered East Asian integration. That doesn't mean China doesn't play an important part in uh, the economies of Asian countries or participating states, but it does give them or deleverages um, them from uh, an over-dependence on a Chinese-centered East Asian integration. And many countries have already felt that, uh, uh, that political influence from Beijing, whether it's Cambodia, whether it's Japan, whether it's the Philippines, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Laos, um, not being on Beijing's agenda can have economic repercussions. And many countries within this particular agreement understand that the TPP uh, gives them uh, an ability to hedge their bets in terms of their economic influence. Again, norm-based track uh, also anchors Japan and the US and other countries into the region at an interest level. And this anchoring is important. Um, they have lots to lose, so it's an, an opportunity to create and bolster and buttress security partnerships within the region, and we've seen that. Uh, we've seen Japan already strengthening agreement, uh, strengthening uh, various kinds of defense and cooperation with uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, the United States has uh, further uh, expanded some of its security cooperation within the region. We even see Australia coming in and, and sh in, uh, investing in some more uh, security cooperation. Again, this is important, linking security and uh, trade into security, and uh, they understand the importance of uh, the South China Sea in terms of trade, or South China Sea in terms of trade, and I think um, last year there's $5.3 trillion US dollars of trade that go through the South China Sea. Uh, about 40 or 50 percent of the energy resources go through the South China Sea, so it's a very important area. So again, the TPP is an important opportunity for multilateralization of the common goods. South China Sea. In terms of India, um, I would argue that the TPP represents an important agreement to spark economic growth and provide uh, impetus to restructure the economy. And going back to some of the previous speakers, it hasn't been about trade liberalization, it's about domestic issues within the Indian economy. But the TPP does provide uh, a roadmap for India's and Indian policymakers in terms of shaping their economy or opening up in different areas. Again, Vietnam has shown that sacrifices in order to, to join the TPP have been far, have overshadowed by the gains in terms of ODA injections, in terms of FDI, uh, in terms of tariff-free access to at least 600 million consumers from rich, developed countries. And this is really important. Um, again, as Deborah mentioned this morning, um, Vietnam has gained uh, incredibly from uh, the sacrifices it's made, and it will gain uh, in the future uh, as the TPP becomes in full force. For India, I argue that it's a strategic opportunity to address structural issues within the Indian economy uh, through the adherence of international norms or norms agreed upon through the TPP. 
And again, it's a strategic opportunity to strengthen India's security cooperation with Asian countries, but also Japan, the US, and other countries to secure interests in the South China Sea. Uh, again, because of this idea of multilateralizing security in the region that brings a ta tactical advantage to mitigating and countering Chinese initiatives, such as the so-called string of pearls initiative. So back to the questions that I posed at the beginning of this presentation. Why has India remained outside these regional agreements? So again, APEC initially had a closed um, regional structure, um, centered on the uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific area. So it couldn't be considered a stakeholder in the Pacific. TPP, again, structural impediments within the, Japan, the uh, India economy, or inability or lack of willingness to meet the standards uh, of the high quality agreement means that it meant that the, T the Indians couldn't join the TPP as a founding matter. And I think importantly, India has not benefited, like many countries in Southeast Asia, from infrastructure development, from ODA injections and FDIs uh, to create a well organized, expansive manufacturing hub in many ways, such as the Asian countries. So if you go to Vietnam today, we have the Koreans and Japanese investing massive sums of ODA and, FD and FDI to build infrastructure. Uh, to build a, a second production network, not to um, de not to to replace China, but to le uh, deleverage from China, to create an alternative to uh, the dependency that those two countries have on China. Are there real economic, political, and security benefits to joining APEC and the TPP? I guess qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, they offer different real economic, political, and security benefits. Of course, APEC is a broader organization with a larger number of trading partners, including China. However, norms espoused by APEC are not agenda setting or of high quality like the TPP. The TPP has real tangible direction uh, and, and, and benefits. Um, joining the APEC, of course, would be a positive, but it's a less ambitious, uh, uh, I think it's a less ambitious approach for India uh, accord, uh, uh, in compared to the TPP. What are the geopolitical consequences? Again, uh, the question is that we need to ask ourselves is what kind of India do Indians want to be? And that's an important question. If the uh, Indian wants to be a regional player, it will stay out of these organizations. If it sees itself as a global player that would like to have global influence, or even a regional, a, a, a regional leader joining the APEC and the TPP would represent an India with more global aspirations, and that's important. Um, I think strategic rivalry with China in the Indian Ocean and, the East China, and East China will be an important factor in Indian considerations. Again, I think Indian policymakers are feeling very, very uncomfortable with um, the Chinese government building ports in Myanmar and Sri Lanka and other current, uh, countries surrounding India. And joining a regional trade agreement that brings in many stakeholders is a way to counterbalance that, uh, that influence. Um, again, a more economic and military reserve. China is what can India considers in its background will compel India to push more forcefully to join these inter-regional agreements. And I don't think that will change. I, it will probably enhance in the years to come. Is India ready? And I think that's the, probably the, the question that you started with yesterday, and I'll end with my presentation today. Again, it depends on the political will, but also on structural change in the India economy to develop a more to develop more competitive how will compare to advantages with the partners in the TPP and APEC. That being said, India is not one country, and I'd like to emphasize that you know we have technological meccas like Bangalore, we do have good infrastructure like the Mumbai Kolkata Corridor, which represents India's capability in terms of technology, human capacity, and infrastructure to meet international competitive standards. And these successes represent but we should understand that these successes represent exceptions rather than the rule. Um, the TPP offers India an institution with robustly agreed upon norms that envision a trade network that links comparative advantages. In India's comparative advantages is right now is, of course, its young population, which I think should be leveraged. Uh, English is widespread, which could be leveraged. Um, and its democratic uh, politics uh, could be leveraged as well. Rather than new goalposts being erected and new initiatives being promulgated at annual meetings that we see in the APEC, the TPP offers India clear direction as rules have been explicitly agreed upon. Uh, just to conclude again, I think the TPP will provide India an important norm-based leadership 
and direction to restructure this economy, and again, this access to at least 600 million consumers from rich developed economies. We talked about our sector, we talked about other regional uh, uh, economic uh, partnerships. Access to developing countries and access to developed countries is a completely different um, kind of economic agreement. When you can sell cheap products to the rich developing country, you're going to accrue many, many more benefits. Uh, again, the salient feature about the TPP is how it links norms, trade, and security amongst its partners, and I think this, this balances India's objectives um, in all three areas. The triangular and permeable structure of norms, trades, and security is not only compatible with Indians' economic interests and comparative advantages, but it also buttresses India's security needs as well. And lastly, I, again, I, I think one of the big drivers in the future behind India's viewpoints on joining these regional organizations will be competing institutions um, like the One Belt, One Road initiative and the Stream of Pearls initiatives coming out of China. And this will shape its directions in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nadi, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we would now open the floor for questions. And you would follow the usual ISA style, so you introduce yourself and we'll take questions in bunches of three. So, yeah, the floor is open. Hi, I'm Edith Scott from Inright Scott and Associates Singapore. I have uh, questions for Dr. Tong. Uh, thank you for that really interesting and informative presentation. It was very useful to me to have the opportunity to hear China's view, which I think is very important to this meeting and this gathering. Um, one, one point is the bilateral investment treaties. You mentioned there are approximately 100. I think they're more historical artifacts at this point. You said that most of them were not important. Um, I'm interested in what, what was the policy goal of starting out um, to pursue so many bilateral investment treaties, and more or less, what is the legacy or achievement of these 100 or so quote-unquote low-level agreements? Um, and my next one is with respect to the pilot FTAs. You mentioned the uh, experimentations with the negativeness in Shanghai. Um, I would imagine that the other three uh, each represents some kind of policy experimentation. And I was wondering um, what your views are on that and how they profile. Thank you. Okay, who's going in next? No further questions. Uh, okay, we'll let you answer that and in the meanwhile. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, first one, the Bell uh, uh, Investment Treaties. Uh, China before 1978, uh, in fact, uh, between the 1950s and 1970s, uh, the government basically nationalized uh, all the businesses, the private businesses. So by 1978, all the industrial uh, businesses, 80% uh, were uh, state-owned and then 20% uh, collective. Um, so from 1972, when the Chinese started to reform, one very important aspect is to attract foreign investors. Um, so that's how uh, it started setting up some special economic zones start uh, in, in Shenzhen and then uh, three other cities and go along, uh, move on to have uh, 13 plus uh, coastal cities. So the objective is to attract foreign investors. And so in that case, the investment uh, treaties that started in the in the 1980s, I think start the first one was Sweden. Uh, so it's basically was industrial countries. Uh, the goal is to uh, attract and to provide protection to say that China is not going to nationalize foreign investment. Uh, so that's the initial goal. Uh, in uh, toward the 1990s and 2000s, uh, BITs have started to also moving on to uh, in developing countries. In that sense, is the mutual benefit or mutual uh, protection. Uh, so that's, that's one change uh, in, uh, in recent years. The second change uh, is to move uh, toward 
instead of preferential treatment for foreign investors to be more uh, sort of national treatment uh, agenda. So that's the second policy orientation. Um, the most recent change is the so-called negative list approach. In the past, it's China's investment is a positive list uh, uh, approach to say uh, China has uh, three categories, uh, prohibited, uh, allowed, and encouraged, so that for, for foreign investors. From that, move on to a negative list. Nothing, anything that's not listed, uh, foreign investors can come in. Um, so those are the changes from a so-called low level to a higher, more advanced, more, uh, more developing country mutual uh, protection, uh, more negative list, and more national treatment. And there's also, uh, for example, a state uh, individual uh, business uh, uh, state dispute uh, resolution. Those have also moved, uh, trying to become more acceptance of uh, investors uh, bringing the, the cases to international organizations. Instead of in the past, it has to be resolved domestically. Uh, so those are some of the changes in terms of the BIT. Uh, on the pilot FTA, uh, the Shanghai one started with, uh, I think it's uh, it's aiming at facilitating the BIT with the U.S. So to experiment, uh, the first the first round of, of negative list was basically uh, dismissed by many investors because it's basically the opposite of the positive list. Um, so, so that it covers all the things that was not mentioned in the positive list. Uh, and then the second round is uh, shrunk, uh, shrunk that negative list by one third, um, roughly one third. Um, so that's the uh, main objective of the Shanghai Pilot FTA. Uh, the other three, uh, the one in Guangdong that aims to, uh, to, to strengthen financial sector cooperation with Hong Kong. The one in Fujian is aiming at closer economic ties with Taiwan. And then you have uh, the one in, in Tianjin, which is quite close to Beijing, is looking at so-called financial <coughs> innovation. Um, I'm not too sure in terms of the, uh, the details. Uh, they, they do have their separate uh, documents of this four pilot programs. Um, they have a slightly different emphasis, as I mentioned, they have a targeted, uh, different targets, uh, but overall it's negative risk in, Hong Kong, in Shanghai, uh, closer uh, financial sector cooperation with Hong Kong, closer economic ties or joint development with Taiwan, and then financial sector, uh, some experiment in terms of uh, financing in changing. Uh, so that's we will go in for the second round, so we'll have Ambassador Shamsar first, then Mr. Pranam Kumar, then Professor John. Thank you very much. Uh, I would particularly like to thank Mr. Pedroza for the interesting uh, presentation that he made uh, on uh, the, especially the perceptions among various uh, countries about uh, possible Indian participation. I was uh, rather intrigued by your uh, description of the membership as being that of like Alcoholics Anonymous. But it also uh, seemed to me that uh, in this case, uh, India is being asked to give up alcohol before joining the Anonymous. Um, I, I was, uh, I was uh, while uh, we have been discussing uh, APEC and some of the other uh, institutions, regional institutions, like uh, the uh, TPP. Um, you know, there is one other institution which nobody has actually touched upon, and that is the East Asia Summit, uh, which is interesting uh, because it is also includes the United States uh, as well as uh, Russia, in fact, and, uh, and all the other, other uh, countries in the region. And I was uh, wondering whether uh, this, this uh, summit uh, has any potential really for uh, uh, advancing, you know, the cause of uh, regional economic integration? Uh, it has uh, not been very active, but uh, I recall that uh, when it was uh, being being uh, 
set up. It was in fact thought of as uh, also a trans-regional organization which would in fact uh, uh, provide a platform for um, cooperation on a, on a somewhat wider scale but including uh, economic uh, cooperation. And uh, so I, I was just wondering whether our, our uh, people who are doing presentations would like to uh, comment uh, on that. Uh, the other aspect I wanted to just uh, touch upon is that, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, certainly uh, believe that uh, uh, at this particular point of time, uh, some of the reservations that I still keep hearing about whether India is really ready uh, for uh, joining the, what is seen as a kind of uh, economic country, uh, mainstream, and is it really ready for Globalization is it really ready for uh, sort of raising, raising, raising the level of its game for cooperating with other countries in the region? Uh, I think that is an argument which has uh, is, is is no longer there. In fact, in India, uh, I think in India it is uh, it is uh, very clear uh, to us that uh, uh, we have benefited. Uh, over the last uh, several years uh, with the globalization of the Indian economy. I think the um, achievement of a higher growth trajectory uh, of 7%, 8%, uh, at one point it even went up to 9%, uh, that this was very much closely linked, in fact, uh, with the globalization of the Indian economy, with the, uh, with the adoption of the first generation of uh, economic uh, reforms. So uh, I don't think in India today there is an argument about whether or not we should be globalizing, whether or not we should be going in for uh, regional integration. There are of course challenges which uh, I think uh, Vishwajit uh, uh, laid out very clearly uh, that uh, th those challenges will have to be confronted. And those challenges uh, which India is confronting are not uh, so unique to India. I mean there are, there are several uh, countries who are part and parcel of these bodies who also face uh, some of those uh, challenges. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, in India, one very important uh, thing to realize is that, uh, yeah, and if you look at the record of India also, we take uh, commitments very seriously. That is, whatever we have committed ourselves to, uh, I think there is, there, is a, there is an assumption that those must be, uh, must be delivered on, even if there is some pain to be uh, to be to be experienced as a result. So the kind of um, comment which uh, uh, Deborah made that uh, you know you sign up to something, but you know you can uh, there will be various various things that that you will not live up to. I mean that is assumed. I think in India uh, we don't have that assumption. Uh, we do feel that uh, we have to deliver on uh, commitment. So uh, I, I think there is there is a certain certain difference in the kind of approach uh, that we have uh, to these uh, uh, issues. At the end of the day, I believe that uh, what will really uh, matter as we go forward is whether or not India is actually able to uh, achieve and sustain a high growth rate uh, of 8%, 9% per annum, hopefully, uh, but not less than 7 or 7.5%. I think uh, the, 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 that compounding of the growth rate uh, will make India a very big market. It is already a very large market. It will become a much larger market. And I think at that particular point of time, the uh, leverage that India would have in terms of negotiating with these different different uh, trade arrangements uh, will be that much uh, much uh, greater. Uh, so, uh, and, and that is very much linked to the policy choices that uh, the that India makes today, uh, that that will be very much determined by how we are able to really uh, bring about bring about uh, you know that that kind of a growth rate by overcoming some of the some of the constraints that we have uh, domestically. So um, I, I I would just like to conclude that uh, uh, I think the very a very size of the Indian economy, which is which is already a very large uh, economy, and is destined to become maybe the third largest economy over a period of time. Uh, and uh, the size of the market, which today itself is quite substantial, and it is likely to expand quite uh, significantly in the in the uh, coming.
15 years. I think that is what is going to really determine whether or not there will be a welcome back for India to these organizations or they will not. Thank you. Thank you. Joining uh, or negotiating 
Um, so given that as a background, uh, the crumb cushion of TPP has also uh, alarmed, if, if you, I may use that word, uh, alarmed China in terms of uh, the lack of progress or the slow progress in the RCEP discussion. Um, so those two, those things combined give uh, China a sense of urgency of, of facilitating or accelerating or uh, pushing stronger uh, in terms of negotiating the China-Japan Korea uh, free trade agreement as well as um, uh, RCEP. Uh, in terms of uh, driving these talks, I think China is still trying to promote the so-called ASEAN centrality uh, because of China's own uh, economic size has become rather large. And I think the leadership recognize its possible implications on how China's neighbors are looking at China and viewing China in a slightly different angle or a different way. Uh, so I think that the leadership recognized that. Uh, in terms of uh, whether uh, providing uh, more uh, accession, uh, sort of giving away in, in the sense of uh, uh, in its talk with, uh, with uh, Hong Kong, uh, with Taiwan, um, and, and this, uh, this is uh, a, a, bit a different, different uh, in terms of discussion because those are considered greater China. Um, there, there has been a lot of uh, discussion to say that China has always been very generous, except India. Um, so those are the, uh, you can hear that even within the, uh, the scholars or, or, the, uh, or the academics in China. Um, I, I think China is, in that sense, perhaps is softening. Softening is uh, sort of uh, views on um, working with India. Uh, as I mentioned, with given the urgency, the sense of urgency the leadership is, is uh, feeling, uh, perhaps more, perhaps softer in relative to China's attitude toward Japan. Uh, but a, a compared to other, uh, such as Korea and ASEAN, <coughs> Uh, is probably still uh, after behind that. But that's my personal sort of uh, read on, on that. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all I can say. Ambassador Shan is leaving. I was going to respond to his, his question very, um, very quickly. I, I, I was looking for a witty response to your comment on the alcohol economics. So, and I, I suppose that perhaps it might be, the analogy might be extended to say a recovering or relapsing alcoholic might be to show some more bona fides before, before being admitted. So it might be seen as just uh, getting the alcohol out of your house before you come back to the membership. But, but seriously, on the, on the East Asia Summit, there's, there's this funny um, evolution in regional architecture that would, would deserves a, a two-day conference all on its own. But there, there remains this view that, is, is, that was really propounded by the United States, that APEC was for economics, and the East Asia Summit was for geopolitical security things. Now, that happened sort of really true when you, when, you had, when you get admitted to the AES, it was, you accepted the agenda in its entirety, and that agenda in its entirety Included at that time a very deep sort of discussion on, on CPN and, and the after that had been taking place there. But it, that sort of since gone, and, and most people seem to have accepted it. It seems this sort of division of labor as convenient as it is. But I think there are many who, who argue that it really is rather inconvenient to have these two summit level organizations with vaguely the, the same people talking about probably the same things except in their communiques, which are rather, which tend to still adhere to the, at least the, 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 from the appearance that one talks only about economics, one the other talks about our security. But it's a very important um, question that remains on the table, something that your, your, your partner in crime um, 
Kevin Rudd, I think, had tried to resolve uh, some time back to much, uh, much, I guess, um, um, disappointment. Um, I think it's an AP will remain the primary institution for talking about these these issues and, and beginning, as, I suppose, as an incubator in the APIC language for regional economic integration things and for the socialization of norms and and getting agreement on specific norms. I would sort of take up some issues with, with Stephen, uh, but but APIC has a tremendous history of of getting consensus and agreement on really very very difficult. Um, in 1993, the non-binding investment principles were agreed on by APEC, um, um, but not um, at the same time that the MAI was failing and failed at the at the OECD and at W and at GAP level. So, so I I I I, 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 I a bit of caution I think in in, in, in in thinking about APEC as a norm setting. I think it's a socialization place where people get to agree and or disagree on on different issues. A very important one, um, where where I think imputed to world power like like India, and I think we have a great deal to offer uh, in the future. So that's how I hope to. Yes, one question. Uh, I guess on the, on the last comment, I think the East Asian summit moving forward in terms of East Asian integration must be joint led between China and, and the United States, and that, that that's the way that. Uh, China views any kind of regional integration must be the partner of equals. When they see themselves as equals to the United States and not not willing to compromise with junior partners and what they consider junior partners like Japan and Korea and other countries. Um, so that's my point of view on, on fostering regional integration in terms of the East Asian summit. And then I think Panam's comment about India and the TPP and, and visualizing different combinations of how to move forward with the TPP. Again, I think it's a, it's a roadmap to move forward for India, and um, it's not something that can be exceeded to today, maybe five or ten years. And as you said, some of the forces are Japan's or India's important trading partners and important political partners, Japan and, and the US, will probably be part of that decision. Okay, thank you. I think uh, if there are more questions, we should have them over to you. D is waiting for us. So thank you, all the panelists. And it's, and you're from my Thank you again.